Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a little introduction for those that are new here. I'm Jeremy Maestas, ecologist with the West National Technology Sports Center uh, based in Oregon, but I focus on uh, helping our working lands for wildlife teams, specifically in sagebrush country. And I'm really excited this morning to get the opportunity to share with you um, some of the latest thinking on how to tackle perhaps one of the most um, severe threats to our rangelands in the Intermountain West in particular, uh, right up there with uh, woody expansion, which we talked about yesterday. And, and that is this threat of exotic annual grass invasion. Um, we haven't had a lot of hope on this front for forever. And I finally feel optimistic. I'm starting to see a path forward. Our partners have played a huge role in helping um, have some breakthroughs in our thinking. And I want to share that with you here today. And I think uh, you'll be excited as well if you struggle with, with how to tackle this beast. Um, uh, I think we have some ways to chart a, a new path forward and uh, incorporate this as part of Working Lands for Wildlife. Okay, so we're going to go through a similar roadmap as yesterday afternoon. And you'll see a lot of familiar figures and a lot of familiar themes, and that's very purposeful. So we'll start with some background on the problem, why it's a problem, where. Uh, we'll go into strategies for tackling it and some exa examples of successful strategies and, and uh, the practices and programs people are using to do that. And then, um, again, kind of end with some step-by-step, -step, you know, how do we build a strategy and what data is available to help us do that. So zooming way out at the scale of the continental US here, um, society is starting to awaken to the impacts of invasive grasses on our ecosystems. And it's not just rangelands, they're impacting uh, forests too across the country. Uh, there was an article here just last year in the New York Times, um, uh, a science paper that's documenting the effects of invasive grasses and, and how they're accelerating uh, natural fire regimes in eco-regions um, all across the country. But in particular, uh, we're going to focus on the effects here in the West. And that includes not only um, what I'm going to talk about, mostly the sagebrush system, but for those of you in the desert Southwest, you've probably seen this as well with species like red brome that are taking over and uh, really accelerating that fire cycle in the desert. So I think some of the same concepts are applicable to you as well. But I am going to drill down and give you um, the case study from the sagebrush biome uh, because we have fleshed that out more and um, the species we're specifically talking about here should be familiar to those of you that work here. Um, cheatgrass is the big bully on the block, uh, by far the most pervasive. Um, it's estimated around 50 million acres in the West already have more than 15% cover of cheatgrass. So it, it is very widespread, found in every state in the country. Um, Medusa head and Ventnata are right, coming right behind it, and they're even worse, a lot less palatable, and um, they will replace cheatgrass. So we're concerned about those two other invasive annual grasses. Um, these species are winter annuals, which means uh, they germinate and green up in the fall and winter, and they're kind of sitting there waiting to take advantage of the moisture that normally comes, uh, you know, over winter and then into the early summer. Uh, and cheat our native vegetation of that precious moisture. Technology is really helping us better understand the extent of the problem and how it's changing through time. So this is data from RAP um, we're, we're going to be using in our planning exercise. And if you just look at the change over the last you know, 30 years or so, it, it's incredible. We've seen large portions of the Intermountain West get uh, worse and worse and new areas getting invaded all the time. And so our um, invasive annual grass surrogate here is, is the wrap data that's it's an annual herbaceous cover layer. Essentially it includes um, all of our annual species 
but in this region, we typically don't have a high amount of annuals on a year-to-year -year basis. And so when you see high amounts of annuals persisting, um, we're really confident that represents invasive annual grasses. I don't think a lot of people know that cheatgrass doubles the risk of wildfire. Um, the science has really shown this pretty clearly that just having a little bit even on the landscape really um, creates a continuous fine fuel source that helps fire spread faster um, in native vegetation that would have been traditionally more clumpy with some bare ground spaces between that would have allowed fire to, to tamper down. So it really creates that tinder box shown here in the upper right. Um, doesn't take much. In fact, some of the firefighters out here literally call it grassoline because it lights on fire so easily. And cheatgrass creates this positive feedback loop that's increasingly difficult to get out of. More cheatgrass equals more fire. More fire equals more cheatgrass. And as a result, we're seeing a lot more frequent fires in the region, especially in the Great Basin where the effects are um, most severe. Some areas have burned up to seven times in the last 36 years, and that's opposed to uh, natural fire regimes that are on the order of 50 to over 100 years naturally. And the consequences are severe for people and wildlife. Invasive annuals impact forage production a uh, friend of mine, John Griggs, is a rancher at a Maggie Creek Ranch, Nevada, um, talks a lot about this problem. He's kind of in the epicenter and has uh, had to live with the effects of cheatgrass. And, you know, some ranchers use it while it's green, but uh, he says this is why they call it cheatgrass. Just when you think you can count on it, it loses that green and dies. Your forage is gone. Species like Medusa head can reduce carrying capacities up to 70%, it's because it's even more, um, less palatable, that high silica content. Our Oregon NRCS folks have done some cool economics um, on this, uh, showing uh, the effects of waiting too long to treat the problem. So if you wait to address invasive annuals till you have a high amount, it, you're really um, never going to catch up. Uh, in terms of the production you could gain versus the cost it takes to restore that land. So producers are money ahead if we can get on this early and uh, that, that gain translates into, you know, more forage and more beef. And uh, that's, that's part of the reason we're so concerned with the sustainability of our ranching is this is eating away at that over time. And of course, from a wildlife standpoint, it's devastating, um, not only from the direct habitat loss because of that fire cycle where we lose sagebrush that's fire intolerant and it takes uh, decades to come back, but even before fire happens, uh, it's been said that invasive annuals put rangelands in a persistent state of drought. Imagine if you only get 12 inches of precipitation a year and something is on top of that soil taking advantage of those precious raindrops. That doesn't get down into the soil and grow more browse for our mule deer and wildflowers and insects for our uh, growing hungry sage grouse chicks. So there's problem even before the wildfire effects are seen. But we're starting to get a better understanding of cheatgrass risk and this has really been a, a big breakthrough over the last decade in our understanding of the role of soil temperature and moisture and how that drives um, risk factors with cheatgrass. Like I said, cheatgrass it can be found almost anywhere, but where it really thrives um, varies uh, based on these abiotic factors. And uh, we have some great maps that resilience and resistance layer that's on a uh, wrap now, you can visualize it up here in the left. Uh, shows you spatially that variability. And so the warm and dry country at the lower elevations, um, that's really where our highest risk of cheatgrass conversion is. The upper elevations, cooler moisture, north facing slopes, um, they're more productive uh, and just a less suitable environment for uh, species like cheatgrass. And so 
Um, we're, we use that information now to mitigate risks as we do management out there on the landscape. And our soil survey has been absolutely critical to putting together the map you're seeing here. We're, we're actually using um, that soil survey temperature and moisture data to give us this um, core scale index that helps us understand the context of where we're working and the risk factors. If you just back up, the big picture is we want to stop this undesired state change that's happening at large scales. And we had perennial sagebrush dominated shrublands that would burn and come back to perennials, but that's slipping away now towards uh, a shift to an annual grassland dominated state where perennials just can't get reestablished. And uh, we get that positive feedback loop of just more and more uh, annuals through time that is really difficult to return from. And, you know, science is helping us understand the role of our uh, native perennial plants too in fighting back. Long term, healthy perennials provide the best defense mechanism to keep annuals out. Invasive annual grasses are, um, can't compete with our native perennials. Uh, if we can keep them out. Um, those healthy root systems really bind up the soil and provide very few opportunities for other plants to establish. But if cheatgrass and other invasive annuals do get established, it's a game of seed bank depletion, uh, much like we heard yesterday with um, cedar and juniper invasion, where we need to be thinking at the level of the seed source. How's it getting there? And once it's there, how do we deplete it? because the seeds of, of these invasive annuals really only live, you know, are viable for a few years in the soil. And so um, multiple interventions over a few years, we can really beat this back and perhaps manage for those perennials long-term to keep our rangelands healthy and resistant to that invasion in the future. And so that really forms the basis for a shared vision of working rangelands that are both resilient to fire, able to handle fire and come back, and also resistant to future invasions. We know we can't just spray and pray, you know, in other words, kill those invasive annuals and walk away. We have to have, um, we have to manage for something and that something is our perennial plant community. And so we combine these concepts in our decision-making, right? So that if we're going to do um, some kind of weed reduction, we're also thinking about, do we have the perennials there to fill the niche? Um, Mother Nature doesn't like a void. And so we wanna make sure that we're thinking holistically when we uh, treat this problem. Now with all that advancement over the last decade, which has been exciting, um, you know, we're still kind of stuck. We haven't really implemented large scale treatments where we could say, here's a success story, you know? Um, it's been difficult to move off of dead center. We do have some great local examples of success, but as a whole, we're left wondering why haven't we been as effective as we'd like to be. This ought to look familiar to those of you that were with us yesterday. Same concept applies here. We often just wait too long to address invasive species problems we're stuck being reactive instead of proactive, right? Uh, again, those figures on the right here, if you're in a landscape that's relatively uninvaded and trying to manage some small new invasions, you're much more likely to be successful long-term than in a landscape that is already infested with annual grasses where you're trying to preserve little postage stamps. And what happens is you might be successful for a period of time but the minute you take your eye off the ball or the funding runs out, you get reinvaded, you get burned, you, you have the effects of the neighborhood going on. And so we want to bring these concepts together into this mental model we've introduced you to of a proactive spatial strategy. And that's really what we think has been missing as a community. Um, we have our local scale knowledge and the science about the role of perennials. That's fantastic and we need that for the day-to-day -day management decisions. We have some abiotic risk tools that we can use to 
better understand um, you know, when we do actions on the land, what are our risk factors. The next order up is this proactive spatial game plan where we identify those intact cores that are relatively uninvaded and uh, we defend them. And we, you know, the preferred direction of management again here are the arrows. We'd like to start there and move out instead of um, simply chasing the ambulance like we talked about yesterday. Where do we see the greatest outcomes? Well, when we bring these three elements of the Venn diagram together, our intact cores, where are the places that are relatively uninvaded, still healthy rangelands? Where do we have wildlife strongholds where people uh, and many of our stakeholders have concerns and uh, we wanna protect those wildlife values for society? But then also equally important, and you'll see here in our example, that cultural will to, to get after it. We have been lacking that as a, as a general community. So when it comes to invasive annuals, there's been somewhat of a um, helplessness feeling to it. And so we're trying to change that here. We, we need to all kind of rally behind this concept because there's too much at stake. Our, our ranchers are dealing with it every day and they need our help. Um, and so I wanna share with you a really exciting brand new example out of Idaho. And I know we've got several of our Idaho stakeholders on here today. And boy, I just couldn't be more excited about this effort they're calling the Cheatgrass Challenge. This is a proactive strategy for the state of Idaho to halt the conversion of their perennial rangelands to annual grasslands. Just announced maybe two weeks ago um, this has been a project in progress for a year and a half or so. And the, the, I'll, I'll walk you through each of the steps that I got to witness as uh, we participated in that process. But a really diverse partnership has come together to make this happen. And it's inspiring people in other states around and, and uh, the Western Governors Association has really taken up the mantle on this. And we'll talk a bit about that. So kind of breaking down this um, example of a, of a strategy. This one really started with cultural will. And I really wanna give a shout out to our state conservationist, Curtis Elke from Idaho NRCS. You know, uh, he was the one and along with Astrid Martinez from Wyoming, uh, we were at a Western governor's meeting where all the governors, all the staff, everybody's wringing their hands about this invasive annual grass problem and what we're going to do about it. And they approached me and said, hey, we want to do something about it. You know, we're action oriented. We need to help our producers. We get it. We see the problem and we don't really have a choice. We've got to act. Uh, and so they went back and uh, really helped um, bring together a technical team of not only NRCS staff from both Idaho and Wyoming state office, but uh, a lot of the partners here uh, in Idaho in particular came to the table and said, you know, we're in, tell us how we can help. And so literally you go around the room, this is the room we sat in a year and a half ago and we've got the Bureau of Land Management, our public land partner, big piece of the West out here, Fish and Wildlife Service, State Fishing Game, our state lands and Department of Ag partners, and uh, our landowner leaders, um, producers who are actually impacted by the problem. And so that cultural will was where, where this effort really got its momentum. And we finally have the spatial data to do this kind of an exercise. This is new. We have not had the data we have today. We, we didn't have it five years ago. So we can finally start to do these um, spatial planning exercises that give our local management context and a, a strategy to work towards. And so um, we've seen an explosion in people mapping rangelands. There's lots of different products out there, but we started here with um, the wrap annual forbing grass cover data. So uh, that's kind of the forms the basis of our, our data planning uh, uh, template but we also brought in concepts from the Great Plains. So we we invited Drock Twidwell out to show us that transitions data 
relative to annuals versus shrubs? Where are those boundary lines where uh, the rangeland is shifting from perennials to annuals today so that we could get a better idea of our management um, concept? Okay. Here's where we rolled up our sleeves, right? That group of motivated partners sat in a room for, you know, it, it was like a day, a solid day of uh, just looking at maps and talking about strategy. And we did have that mindset of trying to identify relatively intact cores. Um, Idaho is probably ground zero for the cheatgrass problem. If you live in Boise, every single year you drive the interstate there's fires raging um, all along it. Uh, it's that Snake River Plain is the perfect hotbed for cheatgrass. Um, unfortunately, we spend most of our time reacting to the problems that uh, arise from that heavily infested region. And while we do that, the resilience of our remaining intact areas is decreasing because cheatgrass and other invasive annuals continue to get a, more of a foothold. So, this whole concept was to identify the remaining intact cores. And you can see that here with the, the colored up map where we show you, you know, we just visualize that uh, vegetation cover data in a way that helps us make some decisions. So like those green areas are what we're saying are low amounts of annuals, less than 10%. That formed kind of the basis of, okay, well, if we were to start managing invasive annuals, let's start in big regional areas where it's not too bad yet. Um, then we identified, well, where is it already converted? And so that kind of annual grass region where it really stands out as, you know, red meaning it's dominated by annuals and the orange kind of this on its way to being dominated. And you can see a very large region already dominated. And so we divided up the state into those regions, right? So you kind of have that dotted line in between those two regions. That boundary is the transit, the rough transition zone. So we use that transitions data um, along with uh, local knowledge and uh, just the straight vegetation cover information to say, you know, where would we, where do we think things are actively changing over? Where's that boundary? And as we started to do this exercise, I'll just tell you that people are very uncomfortable drive, drawing hard lines, you know, polygons on maps because they know it'll be used to make decisions and some people get left out and all of this stuff. And so uh, one of our, our rock stars there at the governor's office, you know, Josh Uriarty, you know, finally stood up and said, hey, why don't we do this guys? Why don't we just make them dotted lines and just like a rough idea to just show the concept that this is a general zone of transition. It's not a hard line, um, but this is where we're starting to see we're going away from this core into a more uh, different uh, state, I guess. So that was a breakthrough for the group. They were a lot more comfortable with that concept. Um, and so this kind of formed the basis of the strategy map. Then we put the arrows to the map and the arrows represent the actual strategy, the preferred direction of management. And so the cheatgrass challenge strategy is at a statewide level to first defend relatively intact core areas from further annual grass conversion. Second, once we bolster those areas, we wanna grow those cores over time. So do the restoration needed to make them bigger. Finally, uh, we recognize there will be continued problems with um, life and property issues in areas that are already heavily impacted by annual grasses. So we're not ignoring that. We're just placing it in the order of priority we would prefer to work if we have a choice. And so we're going to continue to do things there that are, our expectations are different in those places. You know, we're not expecting to restore those to perennial sagebrush rangelands again, right? Those are going to be places where we're just trying to mitigate the most severe impacts that have already happened. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the last thing I wanna mention is, uh, 
we brought in the sage grouse priority areas, right? So that wildlife value, um, Idaho uh, partnership, very concerned about sage grouse habitat and uh, conservation. And so some of the polygons you see overlaid on this map are those wildlife strongholds. And those get used to further prioritize where we're gonna start in these relatively large regions. So once we had that basic map, wasn't overly prescriptive, it left a lot of flexibility to local land managers and partnerships. It just said, hey, if you live and work in this region, boy, we'd sure like to work with you to defend this place over time. So we did put some additional thought into the specifics um, and, and the team put together this brochure, uh, you know, that's, you know, 10 or 12 pages or something of information that's more details on, okay, what do we do with the strategy? What are the uh, types of things we want to see implemented and where? And our public affairs staff, uh, Mindy Rambo, I'll give a shout out to her and NRCS Idaho, just fantastic, um, you know, job of making this stuff attractive and something that the public and our producers um, would find appealing to, to interact with. And so I'd encourage you all to go to the Idaho NRCS homepage. There's a Cheatgrass Challenge button and uh, check out the resources that they've put on there. So in that brochure, here are the types of practices that we're implementing, right? So the how and the what of the uh, discussion that Tim and Matt have been um, providing with uh, uh, practices and the programs, what specifically might we wanna do? And so um, obviously from a big picture standpoint, we're talking about herbicide seeding and grazing are, are the primary tools in the toolbox. Um, monitoring, again, you know, if we're going to be doing some early intervention, sometimes we need people out there on the ground trying to catch these things early. And so we may need to get creative with our monitoring um, and perhaps our programs to figure out how can we incentivize the detection of these problems before they're uh, too far gone. And um, we constantly are getting better tools. I've just learned about some new products, some new herbicides that give us multi-year control over the seed bank of invasive annuals, which, you know, it could be um, a very promising time to actually attempt this at, at larger scales. So we're putting those practices that we traditionally do into spatial context. Um, and so we're not just doing everything everywhere. It's kind of the right practice in the right place all towards this strategy of defend the core, grow the core, mitigate impacts. And so um, we talk about in core areas, things like early detection, rapid response. You still have an opportunity to keep invasive annuals out, um, manage those seed uh, sources if they are there and really deplete the seed bank. But as things get a little bit worse, um, we're gonna move into a phase of aggressive restoration, you know, um, Multi, we may have to treat that land and then replant it to actually get it to perennials again. Um, of course, post-fire rehab, you know, we're going to be responding to that across the spectrum. But, you know, hopefully we aren't having to, we can prioritize, I guess, these regions that are still relatively intact if resources become limiting versus our current model of prioritizing, um, you know, wherever the latest fire has occurred and spending a tremendous amount of resources doing that. Um, we can use this information to focus on places that have a high likelihood of returning to uh, those perennial rangelands. And then finally, we're not abandoning those most impacted places, but we could do things like fuel breaks and targeted grazing to reduce those fine fuels in areas that are already really bad, those big regions that are already bad. Let's um, protect life and property. And the Idaho partners don't mess around. Um, they got their strategy. They also set in motion funding um, simultaneously. And so this is an announcement from June 29th. Uh, that rolled out with the announcement of the Cheatgrass Challenge, six 
large scale demonstration projects that have been funded. So they worked, uh, uh, our NRCS folks, our, our SRC at the time, James Eller, man, he uh, worked with our local staff to set up meetings where they actually went out to the communities, talked about the strategy, said, hey guys, here's what we'd like to enlist your help in doing. And the partners came along, helped tell the story, helped build that momentum. People applied for these projects. And uh, these are the types of projects you're getting, right? And so uh, talks about, you know, their first investments are gonna be placed in these core areas where invasive annuals uh, are relatively low. And the goal would be to defend those and grow them over time. So all that same language that we're talking about translates into our um, communications with the public, communications with our stakeholders and our staff. And so we're starting to see these large projects that now um, they'll go to work for a few years to try to make a difference on that landscape. And the funding sources are really diverse. So NRCS is leading the way with EQIP, but uh, right alongside us, we've got a host of state and other federal funders that are throwing a scratch in the game, including um, the BLM on the public land side, getting their folks and their resources behind this. And then we're leveraging partners like NIFWIF who, uh, you know, go out and seek additional funding resources to help us. So there's a lot of different creative ways to get this done. So what are we expecting out of that? You know, we, we've spent a little time as a group thinking through, well, what would be the desired outcomes? We know with a problem this bad, um, it's not a one and done treatment. And sometimes, you know, it can be very frustrating if, if we only have the resources committed to go in there once and walk away and we know what's going to happen, it goes right back unless we have a plan to fully restore that site to its perennially dominated condition. And so here's what they sketched out, I guess, is um, large scale outcomes that would be desired. And first and foremost, it's actually motivating enough people to actually take action and do some large scale demonstration projects. Let's get some things on the ground. That success breeds success and more people will start to believe that we could actually do something about this problem. Um, we're also going to be monitoring vegetation data to see if it's heading in the right direction. In other words, more perennials, fewer invasive annuals. And we can leverage our remote sensing data uh, like RAP to monitor those intact cores and see if they're being maintained, improved, or expanded through time. In other words, have we actually halted those regional state transitions? So just in summary, you know, what, what did I see that made this successful? Well, first, started with leadership and just an amazing partnership of willing um, staff and people there in Idaho to make it happen. New technology certainly was a game changer and it enabled us to do that, that spatial planning. We also knew when to um, not over prescribe things. So the, the group said, you know, we're gonna provide statewide direction with this strategy, but we're gonna let our local folks um, decide what actually needs to be done. Um, so, that flexibility at a local level to see how would we meet these regional goals um, was key. Of course, that uh, local management actions are now being placed in a larger context, so they are likely to be more effective. And then this diverse partnership, all working in the same direction towards that shared goal. So this should look familiar from yesterday. Um, the, this process does not have to work this way in every state, but if you decide this is useful and that you want to address this threat in your region, here's what Idaho did, and there's no shame in plagiarizing. Um, you know, they brought that diverse stakeholder group together who knew the land, but also knew a bigger statewide picture. Um, we brought in the, the RAP data to actually help us identify those cores. And you can use whatever data you have that's the, the best data set you, you know, have at your fingertips, whatever you prefer. They brought in those other values like sage grouse and even mule deer in cases, their migration corridors, to help further pick places to work 
And that was done by their locals, right? We empowered their local DCs and other partners to prioritize which, which project areas would we want to start with. Those folks are identifying the specific actions and estimating the resource needs. Again, at the state level, um, you know, our programs folks, a lot of others engaged in doing the magic behind the scenes to make all the money come together. And then, uh, of course, they're in the phase now of funding those projects and partnering um, with the science community to track that change through time and uh, really tell the story so that we can get more momentum and uh, have some actual um, landscapes like we've had for some of these other threats where hopefully in five years we can tell some incredible stories of success. This is really an art too. This is not, again, I don't want to scare anybody. This isn't, you know, something you have to have perfect data for. If you have that strategic mindset and these concepts about cores, you can use crayons, you can use napkins, you can sketch this out. It's, it's just a conceptual idea and you can do it at large, lots of different scales. It doesn't just have to be at the statewide level. Okay. Um, Let's talk about data. So while Idaho has been working on this, of course, the Western Governors Association that represents almost all the states, well, it does, it does represent all of the states and all of the geographies we're talking about from the plains to the Southwest and sagebrush country. That group has been watching this um, Idaho cheatgrass challenge develop. Uh, and in fact, just in the last year, they stood up a Western Invasive Species Council that has taken on the issue of invasive annual grasses as one of their first actual project as a group. So um, we've been collaborating with them, providing ideas and data. And here in about two weeks, you're going to be hearing from the Western Governors Association as they roll out um, a new toolkit uh, with data like this that's available now on RAP that provides everyone in sagebrush country, at least with this common template for spatial planning, if they choose to use it. And so I'm going to just um, back out of the presentation for a minute. I want to go into wrap and show you a little bit more on that. So again, here's the, here's the sagebrush tab, the annual herbaceous cover layer. And uh, big shout out to Matt Jones. Matt Jones on our science team was instrumental in this product. This product is a combined product of three different data sets. So what we did here was we wanted to provide the best model estimate of annual herbaceous cover across the sagebrush biome over a period of the last few years. Okay, so it's like a three year average and a what we call a weighted mean across um, three products. And those three products include um, our data from RAP and two USGS products. So these are products that are by far the most widely available data sets on vegetation cover on rangelands. And because this is a diverse partner effort, we didn't want there to be any arguing about, well, whose data set's better, which one should we use? We collaborated to give you the best model estimate we can for um, this kind of all lands, all hands planning. So that's what, uh, if you click on the info button here, you'll get more information if you need to know about what that actually is. But here's what we get, right? So we have this um, familiar color ramp. The green areas are those kind of low or kind of intact areas that are left. And I'm just gonna zoom in on what looks like uh, the corner of Nevada and Oregon and Idaho. And you can see areas that, you know, are anchored with a relatively low amount of annuals in them. And then other stuff that's um, more advanced in the invasion process. So we can use this type of data set to draw some rough boundaries around our quote cores and, and decide on uh, where we would actually like to start um, and you can actually see, you know, this allows you, it's a 30 meter resolution. 
Uh, it's pretty incredible the patterns you pick out. We can see land treatments that have been done. Uh, a lot of these are seedings, maybe post fire. Uh, you can see the boundaries of them here. And so um, you'll be, I think, pleasantly surprised with the product and uh, the ability now for us to do this spatial planning. Um, I'm gonna bounce over now. If you have any questions on that, um, contact me, contact Matt Jones. Happy to work with you all on, with that data. So Brady mentioned earlier about ArcMap and I just wanted to quickly show you for those who want to view this data in their own uh, ArcMap setting. I followed those instructions that Brady gave this morning, adding that web map tile service. And it was so simple. Um, you get something like this and you can actually turn on your own layers. Like, so here's the sage grouse priority areas for conservation, right? Um, and then I also added uh, just for reference, some of the other Great Plains layers too. Super easy to do, okay? And so I'd encourage you if you work in GIS and you wanna make maps, this is probably um, the easiest way rather than trying to download data that will certainly crash your computer because it's so large. But we have that now across um, you know, these two geographies. Okay, let's go back here. And I'm just gonna wrap up by saying, you know, the cheatgrass cover map for the spatial planning exercise is a static map, meaning um, we, don't, we have a few years averaged into one product. That won't change, it just is what it is. But it, let's say you want to use the wrap data to actually plan and monitor projects. You can do that too, just on the vegetation tab and uh, here's a quick example and how I think about using this data to track change through time. So here's an obvious treatment that occurred in a, a very heavily infested area. Um, let's say this dot is a monitoring plot where you wanna know what's happening in that area versus an untreated area control essentially right next to it. RAP provides you that time series data you can easily download this. You can bring it into Excel if you want to make a prettier chart. And we can map out, are we bending the curve? You know, is our treated area on a different path than our untreated area? One thing with annuals is we know there's an incredible amount of variability from year to year, right? These peaks and valleys. And so it's kind of hard to pick out where are we heading. But with a long time series of data, you can start to see um, that change. And so I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, again, Brady offered some uh, kind of follow-up webinars. We're happy to help you with that. Um, there are additional resources here. I put these links into the presentation. You can go to a webinar that Matt and I did recently on using RAP specifically for annual grass management and uh, the cheatgrass challenge. And then of course, um, the other spatial data and the cheatgrass challenge resources are here as well for you. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. I know we're um, ready for our next conversation. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Danielle.